Hello ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to Right Opinion, the home of a twat with too much free time. And businesses on YouTube, whether we like it or not, they're here to stay. And in many cases, I try not to view their presence as a wholly negative one. It's important to remember that one of our primary purposes as creators is to bring entertainment to those who use the platform. And if a channel can do that, whoever it's run by, then we can broadly agree that it's a net positive for audiences. Businesses will always occupy a realm of YouTube, and I do believe there can be a peaceful coexistence. At the same time, there will always be tension. To be honest, it's understandable why more grassroots creators feel unnerved by their presence. Businesses have so much more power and resources at their fingertips to outflank independent YouTubers in many aspects of quality control. They can create high production pieces in a few days that would take an individual upwards of a month, bombing the algorithm with a myriad of content that often gives what many would perceive an unfair advantage to them against the humble creator. When market domination comes from a few large corporations, the outcome for the consumer is generally not particularly positive. It leads to less diversity in general and more control of narratives by a select few people. And in industries that are already prone enough to corruption, it's anything but healthy. YouTube was built on the notion of allowing a person to broadcast themselves without the necessary investment of a larger business so they didn't have to dance to anyone's tunes. And many people would like to keep it that way. Fortunately, there will always be people who will occupy these spaces regardless of their market success. But at the same time, it's still good to have individual figures in influential positions who can represent a human aspect to content creation. And although those businesses have certainly made more inroads on the platform than they used to, there will always be that window of authenticity that seems to separate many of them from the personally driven passion projects. The truth is, one thing that is hard to fabricate is that individual enthusiasm one has for a subject they cover. And although not impossible, many large businesses simply don't see it as a required component for success. And as channels like Looper, Minute Crafts, whatever they're called, and the rest have shown, you really don't need that much framework on personality to succeed. In fact, avoiding building any personal image ensures that they keep any components that may change disposable, and that ultimately, control of the content is still centralized on the people who run the channel, and not those they may outsource a variety of the work to. This formula means that there is a boundary before more independent content and more detached corporate presentations. However, just because there's a rule doesn't mean that there aren't exceptions, particularly in the community that we're focusing on today. Commentary is a genre that large corporations tend to avoid infiltrating, particularly given the aforementioned paragraph. Having a personality is almost essential to the content you're producing. Even if you're merely presenting information, viewers expect at least a little pizzazz. Audience members want to build a relationship based on trust with the person they're listening to. How can you do that when you don't even know if there's a real person behind the channel? However, this doesn't mean that there aren't some willing to take the risk. And one subgenre of commentary knows this all too well, that being the tea community. A popular YouTube channel is about to hit 1 million subscribers. They showed up out of nowhere almost a year ago. And the people want to know, who is Spill? A few years ago, there was a drama in the community that surrounded a channel called Spill. Spill is a channel that hosts numerous videos with high production value and an astonishing upload schedule given those said videos. They also hosted a syndicate of channels alongside Spill, including Brew, Grill, and On The Hill. I'll speak more about them in the future, but a video they uploaded covering their origin at the time had made them seem more homegrown than they actually were. Spill started out as a two-person passion project. One of us has a background in journalism, the other has a background in illustration and video editing. We both love YouTube news and drama. Who doesn't? We wanted to create a channel that had a more journalistic approach to YouTube drama. A thorough recap of all sides of a story, with proper citations. On top of that, we wanted to give something back to the community, by contributing to the conversation with an educational approach. And while a lot of people choose to do creative projects while being self-employed, as soon as more than one person is working on a big project together, it's legally the best option to register as a corporation. The reality was that Spill and their accompanying channels were part of a larger company that had branched out into the tea community, and although people involved with the channel were actually quite interested in the stories that they covered, they weren't exactly how they portrayed themselves, and that gave some in the community reason for pause. Now, I looked online and found out that AWED Corp became incorporated in 2013. I even paid the Canadian government to get AWED Corp certificate of incorporation. So my question to you is pretty simple. Who are you going to believe? Spill saying that the corporation was a reaction to their 2018 YouTube channel growing? Or the Canadian government saying that this corporation has been around since 2013? The tea community appeared to be a target for companies and content farms who had been looking for a way to capitalize on the evident draw of commentary channels. What makes tea chow so attractive to businesses though? Well, I think it's because they often integrate reporting a factual or speculative information in a rather straightforward manner. 
It's not difficult to grasp, but in cases like Spill, all they had to do was attempt to cut out bias from the reporters themselves. So although the channel felt like a tea channel, it was more over a news channel covering tea topics with a nice presentation. And any attempts to add personalities such as their grill channel have not attracted that much attention because of it. With that in mind, the Spill family hasn't taken up too much space despite their impressive collective size, and other up-and-coming creators have still been able to carve out a niche for themselves, one of those being the subject of today, a channel by the name of Anna Oop. Hey loves, your girl is back with some extra hot tea this time. Y'all are not gonna believe the drama that went down this week. Anna Oop is a tea channel who has grown to be one of the most influential creators in her sphere, with over 2 million subscribers on her main channel and nearly 4 million subscribers when counting her other channels, focusing more on true crime. Did you guys ever see any of the TikTok videos about Isabella? What did you think when you saw them? I can't wait to read your thoughts and discussions down in the comments below. Her old American girl charm and sassy nature is well complemented by editing with real personality behind it, resulting in content that appears to have captured the hearts of many viewers, with her true crime content garnering popularity for being a bite-sized accessible breakdown of often very complex cases. All in all, she seems to be the prime example of individual success in the face of a climate that is becoming more and more demanding of creators, with thousands tuning into her channels every day to hear that voice and the person behind it. But was there more to this humble 21-year-old than meets the eye? Well, today we're going to be doing some investigating of our own, following Anna Oop's timeline and seeing whether this success story was really as organic as it seemed. Ladies, gentlemen, and all other colors on the light spectrum, let's look into the mystery of inventing Anna Oop. The YouTube channel for Anna Oop was created in May 2019. It's hard to really say too much about them at this point as many of their videos from back then were deleted, and I do want to save a bit of information for later. But I think from the off, Anna knew what sort of creator she wanted to be, particularly with a name like that, which refers to a popular meme that regularly circulates around the beauty and other communities. I crashed in my back seat for a couple of hours, and I- oh. The video started off quite modestly with a style that was similar to many other tea channels at the time. Content that delivered information in a mostly verbally free text format over copyright free soundtracks, being interspersed with the relevant clips to the discourse. The topics she chose were also those which were long established to have proven dividends for creators. These subjects mostly included large influencers and even celebrities such as Ariana Grande or Bretman Rock. Not all of these videos were necessarily unbiased or journalistic, some of them were heavily opinionated, such as her videos on Nikita Dragon. These are all important aspects to building an individual's relationship with an audience, whether it be positive or negative. There are people who like Nikita Dragoon, there are people who do not like Nikita Dragoon. But having people who care is already half the battle to engage them with your videos. Such content drives up engagement and encourages people to like, dislike, and leave their comments. However, if you're only known to be a dedicated hater, then you're not really going to build much potential with your viewers. Your takes still need to be somewhat reasonable and elaborated from their point of view, and Anna Oop did that for many people. Her strong skills in production and conveying digestible, if lightweight, information garnered her an audience very quickly. And when I say very quickly, I mean nearly immediately. By the time December 2019 came around, Anna was already approaching 50,000 subscribers, something that few creators could merely dream of in the first eight months of their content creation. But subscribers weren't the only thing she was building. Most importantly, she was building a rapport with those who viewed her, and she knew the importance of this. She'd regularly advertise her Twitter and Instagram so she could promote fan art of herself, and was seemingly an active member of the community at this time, talking with audience members and fellow creators. She had a few gimmicks as well. The most interesting one was calling her viewers and people she interacted with love, an intentional misspelling of a word that can mean a term of endearment in certain places. They were building a persona with identifiable yet unique characteristics, and people were tuning in for them. Yet there was more work to be done. Heading into the new year of 2020, Anna seemed determined to take her channel to the next level, and in January she switched from the commonly used text format to using her own voice. Normally you'd think there would be more of an announcement or at least some build up to such a change in format. You'd think there could be some attention in a voice reveal at least, but it seems that Anna didn't want to make a scene and I can't blame her for that. The first documented video to use her voice is the upload on Nikki's tutorials, and given the subject, Anna's sombre tone appears to be appropriate. Of course, many people 
people are all pretty mad about this and want to know who did this to Nikki. There's been a lot of speculations, and some people are even accusing famous YouTubers and some of Nikki's closest friends. There were even rumors that one of the blackmailers was the company Two-Faced, who had previously manipulated Nikki into going into a deal with them where she lost millions. Although at first Anna Oop's delivery on subjects appears quite subdued, with each passing month she seemed to find more and more zest when covering these topics, gradually transforming into the more bold and brash character people are familiar with today. However, it wasn't just what was being said on YouTube that was important to Anna, and throughout the year she said about many ways that would familiarize the viewers with her as a person. Hi loves, your girl is back again. So today we're going to talk about Tana Mojo's infamous reality TV show on MTV. And y'all, this show really ain't it. In spring 2020, Anna's existing Twitter account was deleted, seemingly suspended, and a number of videos were purged from her channel. The reason being somewhat unknown is many of these videos weren't exactly poorly performing, but it seemed to work, as the summer of 2020 found Anna increasing her view and subscriber count at breakneck pace. However, she wasn't without her challenges. In May 2020, Anna's channel was demonetized by YouTube, who cited unoriginal content being the reason. Anna took to Twitter to dispute this, highlighting the amount of work that she puts into her channel. Given the amount of secondhand material used by T-channels, this isn't a rare occurrence, as YouTube often struggles to distinguish the two. Anna also used her platform to stick up for another creator who found themselves in a similar situation. She also found the time to be outspoken in support for social causes such as BLM, the Lebanon crisis, and LGBT rights. Character them as causes that meant a lot to her. She'd post memes, provide opinions, celebrate her birthday, which was on the 12th of July, and even hosted a Twitter Q&A, all of which enabled her to build a closer relationship with her viewers. Some of her answers were a little nondescript, but you can't expect a creator to be comfortable with giving all their personal details out to the public. With that said, her favorite film series is The Hunger Games, her favorite animal is a koala bear, and her favorite game is Roblox. They weren't surprising details, but they were meaningful to those who supported her, and her personality only became more iconic. Ugh, we love an unbothered queen. In the space of barely a year and a half, Anna Oop had transformed the landscape of the tea community into one suitable for her. Her strong production value and excellent upload schedule paired with an identifiable character made her a force to be reckoned with, and Anna knew the importance of retaining people who cared about her. She wanted people to get to know her for who she was, and she wanted people to know her appreciation for them, even occasionally tweeting out love and gratitude to those who helped her find success in an often challenging industry. However, Anna was never one to rest on her laurels. In fact, her success had only made her more ambitious, and on the 3rd of December, she tweeted out that she was working on a new channel that she thought her viewers would go to love. What was Anna Oop cooking? Well, we were about to find out. Not every case is the same, and plenty of unsolved cases still desperately need to be solved. It's really hard to think of a more significant development to the YouTube community in the last few years than that of the true crime genre. Now, true crime has always possessed a presence in mainstream media. It long pre-existed YouTube and will probably long outlast it. However, the storytelling aspect appears to have taken its grasp in the last few years, with many creators garnering millions of subscribers for their coverage of criminal cases, solved and unsolved. There's always been a bit of stigma around the inclusion of such topics, particularly given the fact that it's being published to potentially millions of people, and some would rather have it out of the spotlight. Nonetheless, the consensus seems to be that if these topics are treated with the due amount of respect, then there is a place for them. Interestingly, there seems to be a decent overlap between tea and beauty communities and true crime, with certain true crime creators having beauty roots, with some still integrating it into their videos. And it seems that Anna pertained that same penchant for the morbid. It was clear that by the end of December, her new channel was going to be true crime related. The 18-year-old boy has been arrested for allegedly killing his neighbor to get more followers and fame on TikTok. The first video was uploaded on the 5th of January. It followed the story of a TikToker who had slain his neighbors for fame. It was a suitably macabre topic, though Anna's voice does take a bit of getting used to in this context. Honestly, she sounded more down when she was talking about Nikki tutorials. According to Zach's public defense lawyers, the video shows her telling the neighbors to get off their property. She told them that they better back up because they were not going to like what's coming out of the house. Sounds like a threat, right? Nonetheless, the video was well received and accumulated a strong view count, with the channel approaching 100 
100,000 subscribers in the space of a few days, a surprising statistic all things considered. But it must have reflected the strong cult of personality that someone like Anna Oop had built, and in the next month, she continued to upload consistently on the Anna Souls channel. Pretty impressive considering that she still had a main channel to run as well. And in spite of what may have appeared as time constraints, she also managed to maintain an upload schedule on there as well. Fortunately, most of these videos were limited to approximately 10 minutes at most, which likely allowed her to divide her time fairly evenly between the two projects. However, although she was still experiencing growth on her main channel, the true crime one appeared to be experiencing the greatest proportional success, accruing over 300,000 subscribers by the time April came around. Now, such impressive statistic, you might expect one to consolidate their achievements and focus on how to make sure that such levels of commitment can be preserved. But Anna had different ideas, and on June of the same year, launched another channel, this one called Anna Horror Stories, which, as the name implies, comprises of Anna recounting the rather unnerving tales of others, though recently has pivoted towards more list-style content. Nonetheless, another channel? I mean, I respect the commitment to the grind, but it seems like a lot to keep at, though. To be fair, this channel's content didn't seem the highest effort either. The writing is someone else's, and the footage is pretty standard. Anna may have just been looking to make a pretty penny. However, barely a couple weeks after the first upload on this channel, Anna was back on Twitter again, polling people for her next channel, asking what a good name would be, and quote tweeting another person saying that this would be looking more into the psychological side of criminal behavior. On the surface, it's not unfeasible, but it's certainly surprising given Anna has no apparent background in criminal psychology. She already has a true crime channel and more than enough on her plate to worry about. It seemed like a lot to be planning ahead for when she barely had any opportunity to gauge the amount of time she'd be able to balance between her already active three channels and an additional fourth one. But maybe she really was just that inspired. However, this idea appeared to stagnate a little and developments over the coming months stalled, with a tweet at the start of September explaining that her lack of activity on social media was due to some personal stuff she'd been going through. And with all things considered, this was understandable. Her status as a large influencer had landed her in some drama. Probably the most notable example of this was her feud with that vegan teacher, a controversial figure whose promotion of veganism has been overshadowed by her altercation with other online figures and accompanying contentious remarks. Does this girl seem to you like she might be naturally intelligent, gorgeous, generous? Anna's responses weren't the most intellectual, sometimes merely consisting to the genius content of eating a burger, but that vegan teacher was an easy target, and it allowed Anna to repeatedly dunk on a person who'd already been widely lampooned by the internet. I just know that vegan teacher is probably reacting to this video by pausing it every second just to throw accusations about me saying that I'm this evil monster who hates <laughs> animals and wants them killed. But girl, I don't want to pretend that I wouldn't die for a hot, juicy, big, steamy burger on a daily basis. If I found this drama interesting, I'd probably say more, but it at least established a more queen side to Anna Oop and persisted for the rest of the year. Although drama isn't known to be the most fun to be involved in, Anna seemed to capitalize on the opportunity to make sassy comments about all those who were hating on her, all while continuing to upload consistently on her channels and initiating work on other projects, including launching a Roblox channel which would allow audiences to game with her. Additionally, she finally launched the Anna Uncovered channel, the first video being uploaded at the end of November with a runtime of 18 minutes. While being interviewed by the authorities, police gradually became suspicious of Jennifer because the burglary seemed out of the ordinary. Why would the burglars take out two witnesses but decide to spare one who had clearly seen what they'd done? It made no sense whatsoever. However, the zenith of her online career appeared to be approaching in December of 2021. There had long been questions about the person behind Anna Oop's channel, and a face reveal had long been sought after by the most dedicated viewers of her channel. Anna had teased this before, but with her hitting 2 million subscribers, it felt like a celebration was in order. Anna continued to drop a variety of hints and clues to all that would be revealed, seemingly with a song titled Face Reveal, which really could only imply one thing, especially given the teaser trailers that were posted by Anna herself. Finally, people would have a face to put to this commentator, and viewers were excited. And on the 3rd of December, the video for Face Reveal was uploaded. And people were in shock. What the fuck was that? Let's be real. Bitch, you're just irrelevant. 
Anna Oop's face reveal contains a series of call-outs to other creators who she has previously clashed with and spoken about. But the only person really being the subject of any criticism during this video was her. Face reveal was broadly ridiculed for its subpar production quality and delivery, but also for the simple fact that it did not contain a face reveal. In the video itself, Anna says she wishes she could, but clearly felt that it was not the appropriate time, and later expands on this on Twitter, saying that she was going to, but afraid that she would have to deal with too much negativity. And I understand, I suppose, but why would you make a video titled Face Reveal in the first place then, if the whole point of it was not to reveal your face? Well, Anna says she thought it was just going to be a fun little goof. It's hard to buy that someone as algorithmically adept as Anna would not know the implications of advertising a face reveal on an otherwise faceless channel but maybe the stress from other drama had just impacted her judgment a little. And yet, a few days before this, she had just launched another channel? On top of this, y'all, Anna Hoop is also known for her problematic personality. She's been in scandal after scandal, constantly getting into drama herself. I mean, I think it's about time we see Anna actually do a video on herself. Oh. This was just too much for one person, and surely she was spreading herself incredibly thin by doing so. And not too long after, this theory may well have been proven correct. Now, there had always been stigma around Anna's channel, but a lot of the criticisms up to a point were quite subjective. Her opinions were poorly formed, her attitude was annoying, and her content was clickbaiting. They may have all held some validity, but that doesn't tend to make a particularly eye-catching discussion to those outside of the sphere. However, a couple weeks after Face Reveal, Anna put out an interesting post on her Twitter and YouTube community tab, complaining that a person had copyright struck her without justification or ownership of content that she had been uploading. She also singled out the channel that had copyright struck her, a channel by the name of Truthful Reality, another true crime creator who had covered some of these same stories before Anna. On superficial inspection, one can't necessarily claim ownership of topics, and a strike on a channel for doing so would be wholly unjustified. However, as Anna's tweet and YouTube community post began to pick up traction, a growing backlash from viewers began to form, many of whom stating that Truthful Reality had claimed footage that he personally owned and published solely, and Anna had directly lifted this without any transparency transformative value, not quite the story that Anna had told. Viewers also did not appreciate the fact that Anna had linked his channel, and although not accompanied by any direct call to action, the risk of harassment from an emotionally charged post like this was always present, with some even claiming that Anna had purposefully ignored any chance to peacefully resolve this matter privately, only now taking umbrage after actions were taken against her channel. I suppose it's in the nature of some more irreverent people in the community to behave this way. But this is Anna Souls, not Anna Oop, and many people who are part of these communities think that respect is an inherent part of creating content in this genre. But that appeared to be just the tip of the iceberg. Barely a few days before all of this, a post had gone up on Reddit entitled Anna Oop aka Anna Solves at it again, which documented the alleged plagiarism from a YouTuber by the name of Mr. Balan, a channel with millions of subscribers. It was clear that this video had been removed very promptly from Anna's channel following call-outs from commenters though, and any of its presence had been long erased. Additionally, Bella, a few days after the Anna Soul channel went live, a couple comments appeared on her Twitter requesting her to refrain from stealing content. That was in January, and now we were in December. It seems that rumors have been circulating regarding stolen content on this channel for a while, but only seemed to surface when Anna herself decided to publicly attack another creator for what they perceived as an unjust copyright strike. I can't really comment on the legality of the copyright strike as it can be a very grey area, but it definitely shone a light on what many perceived to be extensively lazy reporting from a creator who was not actually putting time into these cases that they deserved. Claims of plagiarism are not that common, particularly given that the cases themselves can be sourced from a lot of places, so this occurring twice in the span of a very short time was a red flag for some viewers. Some of the concerns appear to address the idea that Anna didn't pronounce the names of people involved correctly and regularly made errors in reporting information. This is all important in the narrative of stolen content, as a person who lifts content may not be familiar with the subject enough to possess this knowledge, and will therefore make errors in reporting the actual details, copying content without actually understanding the subtext. Today we're going to talk about Nikocado Avocado disrespecting Veronica Vang. I had come across this a few times when researching a few of Anna Oop's main channel videos and tried not to pay too much mind to it as I've made more than enough pronunciation and semantic errors in my time. But there was just still something strange about certain mistakes that struck me off as somebody supposedly so involved in the beauty community. Like, how could you spell Jacqueline that way when you've literally used the correct spelling in the title? It just didn't make sense. I'd read rumors that the reason for this was to drive up impressions by having people correct you in the comments. And although it's impossible to confirm, it's certainly something to consider with channels this supposedly deliberate, and particularly relevant with Anna's true crime channels, where such shortcomings could be perceived as seriously disrespectful. 
Given our Oops upload schedule, it seems their final choice was to drop the matter entirely and just create more videos, which she did. In fact, approaching the end of 2022, between her now five channels, she was uploading nearly every day. The tweet regarding Truth for Reality was deleted, and no content that was subject to the copyright claims was ever restored to her channel. However, this situation did place a mark over the genuinity of her content and made people wonder how much of her channel was original. After all, it wouldn't be the first time that this was called into question. Anna Oop's videos were well produced, they looked nice, they had eye-catching titles and thumbnails, and lover or hater, Anna had a personality that provoked a response from audiences. She had a lot going for her. It wouldn't have taken that much to do just a bit more research to avoid errors and any risk of lifting other people's content. Yet all that was being put on the line for videos that Anna didn't need or have to create. It didn't make sense for a person to behave this way. It didn't make sense for a person to behave this way. Anna's face reveal may not have gone exactly as many would have expected it to, but by the end of 2021, many felt they had a better view of Anna Oop's face than they ever did before, with some wondering whether there even was a face in the first place. Well, it wasn't long before alternative theories began emerging, alongside some pretty damning evidence. Now, the trail of breadcrumbs seemed to point out to this channel, who we are going to lovingly call Team Anna Hoop 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 Now, there are always theories floating around surrounding the identity of Anna Oop. Not necessarily people wishing to have all her personal details, but you're asking the question whether she really was a legitimate individual content creator. However, without real evidence proving one way or the other, all you could do was speculate. There are plenty of alternative explanations. Perhaps Anna just outsources a large amount of her work and enjoys a feeling of being super productive. It's not impossible. Outsourcing doesn't necessarily undermine the individuality of a channel as long as they still have a personal connection to what they do. Maybe Anna Oop just really likes money or algorithmic success. They may not be the most noble reasons, but that also wouldn't change her personal identity or connection to the channel. Anna had once claimed to have watched old videos critical of her, even showing one which outwardly shows a thumbnail claiming her channel was a company, so she must have been aware of these discussions. Don't ask. I've already seen all the hate videos about me on YouTube, but let me remind you that my only job here is to entertain y'all, and that's why your girl decided to launch my new channel, Anna Plays. However, the drama surrounding the copyright strike did ring a few alarm bells. A large majority of creators still want to be proud of the work they attach their brand name to, even if there are significant contributions from other parties. But Anna's posts seem to convey a lack of understanding of how this copyright strike even came about. They say it was for no reason at all. Even if you didn't edit the content yourself, the first thing you'd do is try and establish exactly why this happened. Anna is obviously aware this isn't just some random bloke or corporation trying to cash in on her content because she links his channel. This is another true crime YouTuber who probably cares about his reputation as well. So there was clearly some motive behind the strike, whether you think that was justified or not. But Anna couldn't put two and two together, which is very strange indeed. There have been murmuring since then that there was more to this story, including an earlier comment that alleged that Anna had ignored attempts to reconcile the matter in private, but ultimately the story appeared to fizzle out. However, there were other developments that were going on in the nearby drag race community that would throw the case wide open. So let's go there now briefly. Hey queens! Some people found this dig from Carmen to be a little out of line because Got Mick's appearance on the show was a big deal. Regardless of the fact that Mick identifies as male, having a trans queen on the season was huge. This is Butterface. They are a channel that operates in the drag race community that follows the famous RuPaul show of the same name. On the 1st of January 2022, another channel by the name of Top RPDR Videos uploaded a video accusing Butterface of ripping their content without providing any credit, subsequently profiting off the success of this content. In our case, this channel went as far as using parts of our videos instead of hunting down the original material itself. Like it happened with this channel not so long ago which is not only immoral, it's also very much illegal. Butterface then put out a response to this video, and although apologizing for any use of the original creator's material, denied that they were a content farm of any sorts, with a fully documented backstory and a variety of inspirations for their channel. However, this was further taken apart by top RPDR videos and the community as a whole, ripping into the inconsistencies and insincerity of such a post, with further evidence that the channel was merely a content farm. Meanwhile, a channel called Green Gay popped up in my comment section. He took a break from YouTube. 
he says his videos were stolen as well. And if I was sad before, now I'm starting to get a little bit upset. Oh wait a moment, what the hell is this? I'm lucky, wow hasn't noticed, no legal team, they don't mind me. They don't mind you? <laughs> Didn't you just say, oh no, 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 sorry. That was part of the introductory spin on the narrative, designed to gain more sympathy before trying to perform some good old character assassination. Emotions over facts, people. Emotions over facts. However, there was one key detail amongst this all that piqued the interest of onlookers from T channels, and that was the accusation of the involvement of Anna Oop. It seems like Team Anna Oop, being a famous YouTuber with millions of subscribers, thought it would be nice to help her friend Team Butterface with her own channel. Not by, you know, inviting her on her channel, do collaboration, helping her develop her reputation and the connection with her viewership, like we've basically seen happening everywhere else on YouTube since its inception. No, 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 no. She helps by designing her thumbnail. Yes, in Butterface posts, they credit a close friend for helping them get their channel off the ground. They don't say who, but Top RPDR Video seems pretty certain that this special someone is Anna Oop. Although there is no solidified evidence to confirm this beyond a shadow of a doubt, it certainly planted a seed for people to start digging. And not too long after, another creator appeared on the scene, Paige Christie. Today, we are talking about another bustling content farm called Anna Oop. Paige Christie is a commentator who has covered the topic of content farms before, most notably the Spill Saga that followed a similar storyline. She had already expressed her doubts over the legitimacy of both Anna Oop and Butterface's channels earlier on in the previous year, but now seemed to have the evidence to prove that they were both connected. Butterface's first video. And underneath their first video, which is every single time Monet Exchange came for Tamisha Iman, which was posted on the 16th of June, 2021, there was a comment. A comment left by Anna Oop, and the comment read as follows. Hi guys, I see some of y'all are commenting that my friend is copying me. I love the art of drag, and so does my friend. And when they said they were interested in making a channel, I wanted to help out where I could. So I helped them with the thumbnail design gave them some editing tips please no hate to them p.s i love butter this video goes off butterface responded with thank you queen i probably should have mentioned somewhere that you gave me some tips i completely understand everyone's concerns in the comments love you too and this comment can i just say has since been deleted the admission that the thumbnails were created at that point by Anna Oop was all I needed to then go and do some dirty investigation. This is pretty damning information, particularly when combined with the collective research prior. It proved that there was an undeniable connection between Butterface and Anna Oop, and if Butterface was indeed as corporate as they appear to be, then unless they fooled Anna too, there was no real alternative explanation for how such a scenario could have transpired. If Anna truly was a friend, then unfortunately that friend was a business. I assume this was a shock to some, but I think most who followed the situation were just waiting for their suspicions to be confirmed. The truth was that we were seeing one person supposedly pumping out up to an hour of highly produced yet fundamentally hollow content every week. It simultaneously was too bad and too good to be true. Butterface has not returned. And I think it's because they know that they don't goof because the comments underneath a lot of people are beginning to realize that this is a conglomerate. And especially when it comes down to straight up stealing other people's content, this is now majorly overstepping a line. The evidence had been stacking up for a while, but with all of it accumulating in one place, it enabled people to understand the depth of this masquerade. Behind it, a very telling story about Anna Oop. This person who would use their status as a self-proclaimed human being to tell stories, plead their case with YouTube on multiple occasions, and even talk about personal challenges going on in their life was simply not a person at all. And there was no way that anyone involved had merely accidentally acted like an individual. This was a fully committed facade, filled to the brim with first-person pronouns. They knew what they were doing, and they were making a killing from it. But who were they? Well, there was still a little more to uncover. One channel that kept coming up when I would do a thumbnail search for thumbnails that look similar to it was a channel called Rumoured. Then I went into Rumoured's featured channels and I came across another channel called This Happened. As you can see, they all have the same thumbnail style. And then from This Happened, I went and checked out their featured channels tab. And would you look at it? 
There are some people there that we should recognize. One person called Anna Uncovered. In Paige's video, she showed that there appeared to be a nexus of channels connected to each other. Some of these were channels that did masquerade as individual creators, whereas others were presented under the more corporate pretense. However, on researching one of the channel's URLs, Paige found something else. Is that all of the rest of the channel did not have a customized HTML. So their YouTube HTML is youtube.com forward slash C forward slash Daniel O Games. Daniel with the O being massive, games, uppercase S, lowercase S. So one of the jobs it shows is female voice artist for big celeb channels, as well as the second one that was posted 29th of November, which is an American female voice artist for a celeb channel. So the advert reads as follows. They need 10 freelancers. Hello, we are a company called Video Creation Hub. We own several YouTube channels, and one of them is in the celebrity niche. To give you an example of the style of work that we're after, check out these channels and one of them is the channel this happened and the other channel is pop juice this led down a further rabbit hole which revealed two companies creolon and video creation hub both of whom specialized in one thing youtube automation so O works for Video Creation Hub, which are the people who created this Upwork advert. And on LinkedIn, they state that they are a content writer, a freelance writer, and a contributing writer. But not only do they work for the Video Creation Hub, they also work for another company called Creelon Media. So the Video Creation Hub essentially is a company that considers YouTube profiles as real estate. They do something that they call YouTube automation. In essence, these companies are specially designed to build and consolidate large channels and their fan bases. They know how to communicate with the Gen Z mind. Ugh. They don't really list their techniques on the page, trade secrets, I suppose, but then again, I feel at this point it's somewhat evident. So this began to paint another very different picture. There may be actually individuals behind the channels themselves, but the production comes from a third party company who turns that concept into a content farm. Page then provides further evidence to support this, and it begins to look a bit dystopian, honestly. An editor from Blank. Passionate about music, entertainment, writing, Dee has put her love for them together and specializes in music and entertainment journalism. Currently D is a script writer at Creelon Media Group where she writes several scripts a week for the Butterface YouTube channel. Creelon Media appears to be aiming for a plethora of genres in the coming months. Advertising roles in channels relating to soccer, tech space, horror, rap music. They are essentially shooting for world domination or the next best thing. This was daunting. These people essentially create entire automated channels with voiceover artists, with writers, with researchers, with editors, with thumbnail creators, with graphic designers, with producers, with literally just everything it is that you could possibly need to have a channel and make it run. There was really very little to add at the end of Paige's videos. She channels the frustration of an individual creator who sees many of her peers struggling to keep up with the sort of farm that companies like Creolon and Video Creation Hub are operating. Not necessarily being bothered by their existence, but more about the lie that they wanted to present themselves as one of us. Paige also made a follow-up video where she briefly spoke to Truth for Reality and gave his side of the story more attention as well. Yeah, I reached out to her on two occasions I wasn't going to strike the videos. I just wanted her to credit my work. No response. So then they tried to threaten me through emails with a lawyer. The whole thing is a joke. It really wasn't that serious to me. So then I asked him if he had a copy of the email it was that he was sent by Anna Solves. And he basically said to me, he said that he doesn't have it and that the account that they emailed from tried to email him a PDF file. He says that those are often used for malicious attacks. So he blocked the account and erased the entire thread. So take that information whichever way you want to. I'm more inclined to believe this young man only because it's not just him who's saying it. There are several people echoing the same sentiment and several people who came over to my video unprovoked to tell me the exact same thing. That Anna Solve steals content from other content creators. This was arguably the most serious claim relating to the drama and certainly asked more of the companies behind the channels. It also placed the ball firmly in the court of Anna Oop, Butterface and the rest of the channel syndicate. However, their response was more to erase evidence. As noted in Paige's video, the comment from Anna was quickly deleted after it was discovered. The video that comment appeared on was subsequently set to private as well, and a large majority of leads that Paige followed in her video were removed or hidden. Although Anna would later use the phrase, our videos on Twitter, this seems to be the closest that there is to an acknowledgement that this is more than one person. However, in a way, sometimes a lack of response can be considered a response in itself. 
Outside of the occasional tweet, Anna Oop's social media accounts largely fell silent. They stopped posting on their community tab altogether on each of their channels and just returned to the regular upload schedule. Anna Oop still has a personality, unfortunately, but outside of the content, there is no real attempt to build a fan base. Anna Plays, the channel that was designed to cultivate a closer relationship between the channel and the audience, uploaded their last video in May 2022 and has been dormant since. Interestingly, not nearly a month after, another channel returned to the platform, Butterface, with a video about drag queen drama. What a surprise. Their video on the topic of a queen pretending to be a relative to defend themselves was at least somewhat ironic, but the description was what was even more interesting. Here they drop the guise of being an individual person and admit that they are operated by a company and realize the ethical qualms of behaving in such a way. They want to do better and have since adapted a more corporate format to distinguish themselves from other individual creators. This wouldn't have been a bad response if this had been their first response. Unfortunately, they already had one shot at explaining themselves, and many people consider this apology to be a result of their failure to maintain the masquerade. I think the apology also rang hollow in the greater sense as well, because other channels that were seemingly friends with Butterface and were proven to be a part of this syndicate, most notably Anna Oop, were still using personal branding to do just what Butterface admitted to be unethical. But sometimes, friends have different opinions, I suppose. I'm sorry, but why does every Kardashian or Jenner out there try to ruin their memes by profiting off them and reusing them over and over again. Nonetheless, the apology did serve as strong confirmation for the broader theory surrounding these channels and ultimately proved that no matter what was hidden, the explanation remained the same. Anna Oop was not who they said they were and they were just one of the many channels that began to infiltrate the creator sphere. Who knows what these channels are or if we can even identify them. But regardless, if Butterface or Anna Oop's presence meant anything, it meant that they were already here. It's a pretty simple observation to make, but I think what bothered people the most was just the lie in the first place. It's not like this was the only way for corporate channels to survive in the 21st century. There is more than enough proof you can thrive in your own space regardless of who owns you, and there are more than enough successful channels to demonstrate that. They just wanted a piece of the pie, and it makes sense in a way. Personally fronted YouTube channels have far better audience retention. Compare a channel like Anna Oop with Pop Juice. Pop Juice presently has 129 million views with 220,000 subscribers. Anna Oop had 440,000 subscribers with half the amount of cumulative views. The whole reason retention is higher is because viewers think you're a real person, which might be considered a bit of a deal breaker when you're not. So, who is the real Anna Oop? As we kind of found out already, there's certainly a degree of deception involved in the curation of these channels. But when establishing the timeline for this situation, you'll realize there are more smoke and mirrors that had not been accounted for. Let's start from the top with one simple factoid that we know to be true. Anna Oop's channel was launched on the 12th of May 2019. That makes sense to this timeline given the channel's subsequent success in the following years. However, we also know that around the start of 2020, Anna Oop conducted an overhaul on their channel. Their social media accounts and a large number of videos were subsequently deleted. I can't give you the exact reason why without speculation, but I did say I would return to this point. And that's because there is something interesting about their original Twitter that has been preserved. And that is the use of plural pronouns to describe their channel. At first when I found it, I assumed that it could be a typo, but it kept appearing and appearing and appearing to a point where I assumed that it must have been intentional. Anna Oop started out as a corporate channel that knew to an extent it was just that. Although there seemed to be an individual person assigned to their social media, the channel was quite transparent about it being more than one person. However, by May 2020, this had completely changed, and even their YouTube description read that they were a 21-year-old girl from America, which I always found such a strange detail to include in their channel because I don't think that many people could care enough about their about page to update it with every passing birthday. The switch to voiceovers at the start of the new year also changed the game with respect to how Anna operated. They moved towards this more personal bond with their audience and began to integrate things like birthdays, Q&As, things that would draw people in. It was the next step of the business model. This one didn't raise too many abject suspicions at the time because it seemed like a natural progression, revealing something personal about yourself. It all seemed fair and square. However, with the next step, the expansion, some more evidence of suspicious behavior emerges. So their YouTube HTML is youtube.com forward slash C forward slash Daniel O Games. Daniel with the O being massive, games, uppercase S, lowercase S. When watching Betty Page's video, I was surprised when she mentioned Pop Juice's URL, that being of Daniel O Games. I struggle to really think what Daniello and his games had to do with a social media channel covering trending topics. But more interestingly, I'd noticed this when researching the Anna franchise earlier on the day. What do I mean by this? 
The interesting detail about Anna's secondary projects is that Anna Solves, Anna Uncovered, and Anna Horror Stories channels were seemingly founded before Anna Oops own channel was. Now, this wasn't something dubious beyond doubt. Plenty of people have old channels they may revamp for content production, but it certainly made one curious. And then you go to the archives of these channels, and on each of these accounts, you will find an old screenshot of the channel belonging to someone who seemingly has no relation to Anna Oop whatsoever. These channels typically display around a five-figure subscriber count and seemingly all relate to Hispanic content creators, which I also found to be a very strange connection. So it appears the people behind the Anna Oop channel purchased these channels as they believed it would match maximize their chances for subscriber growth, which also explains why Anna was so close to reaching 100,000 subscribers so soon after their first video on the Anna Solves channel. However, when returning to this theory today, I hit a roadblock because the Anna Horror Stories channel that I pulled up said it was created in June 2021, which would have been around the time the channel went live. I took a moment to wonder whether I just made a mistake. It wouldn't be the first time, but I thought I'd retrace my steps to the tweet promoting the channel. I followed the link on the tweets and then it hit me. There are two different Anna Horror Story channels. Has anyone ever noticed this? It appears the second Anna Horror Story channel had picked up where the first one left off, stopping on the first channel in May and resuming on the second channel in June. My guess would be monetization issues as I didn't see any ads on the first channel, but it's still an utterly bizarre situation. Normally, you'd expect Anna to take to Twitter, but there's just this strange period of radio silence, and no evidence that they ever attempted to have the lack of monetization on that channel changed, which is also surprising given they regularly complain to YouTube when they feel they've been maltreated. Perhaps this time, they kind of knew what they were doing was wrong and didn't want to attract attention to it, but that's just a guess. Beyond the assumption that these channels were bought, I mean, I doubt Anna was also a male Mexican gamer in their spare time, the Anna Horror Stories channel's URL was advertised at a forum a few weeks before the Anna Horror Stories channel was launched. The link speaks for itself. Now, on principle, I don't really mind people trading accounts. People can cultivate what they want and pass it on for all I care. However, buying accounts often does feed a very dangerous side of YouTube, the one where people hack accounts to sell them on. I'm sure we all know creators had their channel turned into a Tesla fan page recently. It's not fun. And although I doubt the team behind Anna Oop is hacking these channels themselves, it definitely speaks to the corporate approach of content farms they wouldn't consider the trade they're participating in. In the case of the Anna Horror Stories channel, despite previously being a Spanish-speaking channel, it was being advertised by an American or Canadian user whose approval for monetization message was written in English. It's not evidence beyond a doubt because Spanish-speaking people do live in America, but it's food for thought, yet it's not something that Anna's team would ever think or care about themselves. As they expanded, they assumed they hired more and more people for these channels, and having less ability to actually critically stay in touch with the content they were creating. In a way, ironically, this worked somewhat to their advantage, whereas a channel like Spill's content drew suspicion for being too good for a single person, Anna Oop and their accompanying channels never had to worry about that. They occupied this position where they could pull off the act of being human through what appeared to be human error. But just because something's human doesn't mean it's good. In the meantime, their social media started drawing with a variety of creators, especially easy targets that would embolden their status in the community, calling out others and using a face reveal bait to launch a diss track on all their detractors. It all pointed to one thing. Anna Oop et al. weren't just a content farm, they were a bad content farm, and the only way they were able to keep their feet on the ground in this genre was pretending to be a singular person and simply outmaneuvering all the actual people by rigging an algorithm in their favor by buying channels and strafe running content, while all holding hollow opinions that align with viewers to keep them watching. And the worst thing about it is that it completely, 100% worked. There's one more point I want to make regarding Butterface's apology, and that's a video that was published alongside it. Fans wanted to get to the bottom of things themselves, and even one fan tweeted Trinity and asked her point blank if the account was hers, to which she responded, Oh yes, I'm still on Reddit. You might be thinking, ooh, girl, that sounds like a confession. Well, it is, but it also isn't, if that makes sense. It's not exactly an objectionable video, but it's so strange seeing a channel that is a self-admitted corporation trying to use jargon with intonations that it doesn't feel like they can ever truly understand. Sure, they've dropped the guys that they're a real person, they've said they understand why it's ethically questionable to do so, but they're still trying to pull off that attitude that garnered them the attention in the first place. With the knowledge that there are people behind the scenes pulling the strings to make this video appealing to you, it just feels rather weird. Audiences like to feel they're in control of the content they consume, and that's where the difference between a rather generic 
generic corporate channel and one that's trying to yassify their view count comes into play. A middle ground corporate channel just wants the view to click. It's a transactional thing that both parties are aware of. These channels though, they do something different. They commercialize the viewer's connection with the community and the culture that comes with it. So they appropriate parts of it to appeal to people. To be honest, it's not that I think it's inherently immoral to do that, but I think it does make people uncomfortable, and I don't think people are often willing to support a channel like that, which is probably why the guise of an individual person is always going to be more effective, even if you gave a corporation personality. Unfortunately, it's just not believable that there are a bunch of guys in suits who are genuinely shook over whatever's being said between online influencers. Companies just don't have the merit to appear legitimately interested in certain circles of culture, but it can't stop them from trying. As a corporate channel, Anna Oop had very few defining features, no exceptional research, no great wisdom to impart. But as a person, their personality perfectly fit into a community that welcomed the characteristically audacious creator who just says what she feels and doesn't give a damn who tries to stop her tea spilling endeavors. We all sat through hours and hours of cringe music this year, and I think we all understood that influencers should not make music. Unless you're the hypocritical bitch, that is me, of course. <laughs> Say what you want about Spill. I think many gave them their fair share of criticism back in the day, but they weren't necessarily bad at what they were doing. The least I can say about them is that in the general discourse of corporate-based channels, they did a decent job at keeping their audience informed and entertained. They presented content in a way that many channels simply could not. And those are two of the key tenets of any YouTube channel that I mentioned in the introduction. Anna Oop, on the other hand, was just mass-produced junk food content. I think that's what bothers me the most about their channel as a concept. Corporations do have the ability to do what many individual creators cannot, and they can achieve great feats with their resources and manpower. Have the team behind Anna Oop settled on purposely being less than that because they wanted the illusion of humanity? All these opinions about who was in the right or wrong in their content, possibly fabricated to play to a crowd. It's risky business doing that, and easily leads to contradictions that could harm people involved or mentioned. The truth is that everything is an algorithm to some extent, even personal values and expressions of those that can supposedly organically draw an audience in. It's an inevitability, and plenty of creators have been called out in their time for expressing opinions they may not truly hold. Playing to the crowd is common. However, when you engineer channels with the sole intent to play into the crowd, not only do you reduce the realm of critical thought in that genre, you also may make a lot of damn additional mistakes. The majority opinion isn't always the right one. Making errors is part of life as an individual creator. We're only human and we strive to grow. At the same time, I think most creators' lives would be easier if we didn't make those errors and didn't have to deal with the guilt and shame that comes with them. To have a corporate network that creates a formula to enable those errors is just insulting to the people who spend hours trying to avoid such pitfalls. It also amplifies harm that can be spread through falsehoods and misrepresentations that may not have spread otherwise. This was especially valid with the true crime genre, a section of YouTube that demands meticulousness and dignity for all those involved. The incompetence of Anna Souls could not have just prospectively damaged other creators in the domain, but also victims and their families as well who are often the subject of these stories. That's why a personal connection to the content is often important, because that connection will provide you with an inherent motive to be sensitive to the world around you. Otherwise, the only real motive that exists is the one the numbers and sometimes the numbers will tell you to do something different to the people sure the best way to attract clicks is to exaggerate titles and thumbnails while dramatizing the story and asking the viewers what do you think about this mass murderer but not all content should be treated that way when anna oop moved from the t to true crime there wasn't any real acknowledgement of the sheer differences between the two realms too many businesses don't distinguish that one genre may have different rules to another because they lack that personal connection to understand the nuances which is what caused so much unrest in the true crime community, people felt that Anna didn't respect those cases, and they may well have been correct. The other problem with seeing matters only through numbers is how you interpret the actions of others, and how you interact with criticism. The truth for reality situation showed us that. Separate to the point of copyright altogether, the Anna Solves community post projected the intention of a channel like theirs onto a channel like Truth's, who for all intents and purposes does actually sincerely care about the stories he covers. It's particularly illuminating the comparison of the response to someone like Truth, a smaller creator, and Mr. Ballon, a larger creator. One video was taken down swiftly and silently, the other resulted in a public campaign that only when people called them out for it. And all right, maybe they would have been able to pass as a person with less outrage if they'd merely created content and avoided any outside interactions. But they used this perception as a human to instigate drama with other creators and elicit sympathy from their viewers. It gave them the ability to use those human emotions to leverage favorable outcomes and just attention in general. How that sort of attention could only yield so much good when your own shortcomings become more noticeable and the channels around you begin to falter as well. 
Even businesses stretch themselves thin trying to cut corners, and the same numbers that tell you the more content the better make you forget about the other numbers that gave you those numbers in the first place. In the end, even without an admission, people felt the mask had slipped. An inhuman schedule with an inhumane approach. All was undone. I know y'all have been waiting for a face reveal. I wish I could. Uh, maybe next time. Nothing was real. I suppose behind the scenes there are many ways that the Anaroop squad could have responded with which we would not necessarily be aware of. They could have found a person with a bit more experience in the community and given them greater reins over the research and production. They could have centralized the channel's presence more on an individual, given them control of operations, or at least helped them oversee the work being done on their behalf. They're never going to be as organic as some, but for all we know, these are steps that could have been taken since being called out. Which is why I don't want to presently malign them too much. We're not entitled to know exactly everything someone is doing to improve themselves. However, it's hard to say that outside of that, any individual passion has been developed for the content they're creating. And although avoiding any large-scale controversies, have still occasionally been called out and criticized for a lack of originality in their content. A recent video in particular from a YouTuber by the name of The Asher Show alleges that they have copied his topics multiple times, without providing any credit. February 9th, 2021. Meet the TikToker who thinks she's black. And you can clearly see here, this is the picture that I chose. 10 months later, Anna Oop has the black fishing on TikTok gone too far. November 23rd, 2021. And here's the picture that Anna Oop chose. April 20th, 2021, I made a video called Meet the Biggest Copycat on TikTok. It was about this TikToker new main who would steal other people's videos. Sound familiar? Nine months later, the most disgusting guy on TikTok, Anna Oop. Original copy, the guy's in the middle. Original copy, the guy's in the middle. Two months ago, November 5th, I made this video, the history of the most hated person on TikTok. It did quite well, 889,000 views. But here, three weeks ago, January 6th, the childish TikToker who got canceled for being annoying. It's getting a little too coincidental at this point. November 26, 2022, I posted this. And who posted this January 9th, 2023. And the weirdest part about this, nothing in the description, no references here, but everyone just take a listen and who is speaking at the beginning of this video? Spaghetti! Spaghetti sauce! Meatballs! Hey people that waste food, why do you have to waste food on TikTok? No thanks! Come on. Just a little bit. It's like the more food you waste, the more views it gets. Why? Idiot! It's not funny. You're just being completely wasteful. Am I on the Anna U payroll now? Now I'm voicing your channel? There are a few examples here that I think fall into a gray area, and I'm not sure they point to the degree of plagiarism previously covered, but together they definitely do paint a picture. I don't think this is exactly content theft, but it does kind of represent what Anna Oop is without the pretense they're a real person. Just a hollow machine that can't produce original thoughts or ideas for themselves. Another notable example of this was Anna Oop's video on Technoblade shortly after his death. Hello everyone, Technoblade here. If you're watching this, I am dead. Given that Anna hadn't really shown much investment in the Minecraft community, this video just seemed really out of place for the channel, and the video itself just felt like they were regurgitating information they read elsewhere and adding a delicate piano to provide it with an illusion of poignancy, with a lot of people calling it out in the comments. Alex had rarely shown himself on his YouTube videos as he made it clear to his fans that he prefers to present himself as an avatar instead. And guys, his own fans even recognized Technoblade as his real name throughout the years on YouTube. However, even with content that you'd expect Anna to be a bit more familiar with, you see a lot of comments deriding Anna Oop their rather obnoxious clickbait, luring people in with borderline false statements. I'd probably have more to say if the topics didn't bore me so much, but it is absolutely amazing what some people can turn into an 8 minute video today. But then again, it's amazing what some people can turn into a four hour video too. So maybe it's not really my place. Do y'all love the sound of peace and quiet? Do you wake up in the morning feeling content? No? Yeah, me neither. Y'all? To me, it doesn't feel like anything's changed at all. And it's hard to change sometimes when you have a formula that's working. And outside of a certain sect of people in the tea community, the greater YouTube audience don't tend to watch such content. A majority of people don't care for the drama. They don't read the comments. They don't watch the videos. They simply don't care. And who can blame them? There are only so many hours in the day to spend indulging in drama content. And those viewers are probably more interested in Selena Gomez than they are the person talking about them. The only person to blame really is Anna. 
And, well, they're not really a person. They're part of a company doing what they know best. They say and they do what is best for themselves. They don't relate to that moral obligation that other creators may do. Because from their point of view, what does it matter whether they are who they say they are if they can deliver content that people want to watch? Being an influencer on any platform is profitable. They're celebrities of their own kind who don't have to provide every single detail of their existence if they don't want to. They don't have to show their face. They don't even have to talk. It's the perfect combination for someone looking to make a few bucks. You can create celebrities without proving they're even real. The problem is that when you do that, you force out individuals who actually are who they say they are. That's why Anna Oop really was the worst kind of business venture. In their head, what they were doing was merely trying to fit in, succeed in an area where there wasn't massive competition by corporate channels. But really what they did was take over a market whose sole existence was based on individuality and directly competing with creators who could never dream of keeping up with such a production line. It's like asking IBM to create a computer for your amateur chess tournament. Sure, the computer is going to win, but what was the point anyway? They have their own realms where they can compete, domains where they can succeed and flourish, and generally facilitate the creation of technology that a single person may struggle with. Although owning all the casual chess players is something they can do, is it something they should do? Beyond the conceptual problem of having companies in control of public opinion, it's bad for other creators as well. We constantly have the discussion on YouTube regarding creator burnout, the fragility of mental health, but a creator's first priority will nearly always be to keep their channel alive. And if they're competing with people who have infinitely more resources to do that, then they will struggle. Their channel will either fall to the wayside because they know they can't keep up, or the creator will run out of fuel trying to do so. There's no winning option for the individual here other than to attempt to be a better content farm, and we've already seen the distinct problems with that which can really harm a community. If content is watered down to meet people's expectations and the quality of discourse suffers too, then the only option left for people craving a higher standard of information is for better content farms like Spill. This may well happen, and if audiences choose it, then so be it. Maybe people enjoy content farms. But I'd like to advocate for the power of the individual creators, the ones who are going to talk about these subjects because they care about them. Over time, plenty more Anna Oops are going to pop up and they're going to masquerade as people because it's a market that can be tapped. The parasocial bond that can be formed is priceless for them. There's always a one-way relationship for a business like theirs. Many of these channels will completely lack a personal connection to their content and the community that has instilled a social status on them. Which is why it was so easy for a child like Anna's to lie about their identity in the first place. That's why individuals matter more in these spaces, because there's an expectation to care, an expectation to listen. There's nothing right now I could say to this company, but there's always something you can say to a person. Anna Oop is the sort of channel that I just don't really enjoy, and I honestly wouldn't have too much to say outside of that if Anna was a real content creator. A biased YouTuber who plays the crowd and is careless with details they should be more diligent with? What's new? But the truth is, Anna Oop was more than that. They were a child that built themselves on a fundamental lie, utilized all the advantages of a well-invested company with pre-purchased channels and conveyor belt content, while utilizing audience sympathy by complaining to others about how oppressed they were as an individual creator. They really had their fingers in all the pies. Following the success, the Anna Oop team had the choice to be better as channels as they branched out into more sensitive subjects, and just chose not to be using their increased money to just pump out more content rather than improving what they produced as a whole. I think the most sinister fact about the plagiarism case was that Anna Oop took advantage of that humanity, that belief in their identity, and walked it into a way to attack a creator who had no motive to maliciously take their content down. Anna Oop has removed countless videos from their channel before. It would have been a drop in the corporate ocean, and yet they went down swinging. When the whole network was called out, they just scaled down the project a little, still passing their content off from a first-person perspective, with tons of tea-spilling opinions to this day. It's all a crock of shit. A big crock of shit, and part of me expects I should be more bothered. But in the end, this just feels inevitable. There's only so many arguments I could make surrounding their existence, and all I'd finish on is, why would we need companies pretending to be YouTubers when we already have YouTubers? What does Anna Oop really offer? Businesses on YouTube. For better and for worse, they're here to stay. And in many cases, I try not to view their presence as a wholly negative feature. But they can be, especially when all they offer is a highly processed form of content that is propped up by communities they'll never truly understand. Anna Oop is an example of that, and one can only hope their formula isn't one that is duplicated too often. However, if they are here to stay, I hope they remember there are some things you can't and shouldn't invent. Thank you. Hey loves, your girl is back with the biggest drama of the year this time. I'm 2T channel, which is called Anna Oop. Now, I didn't mention-
upload rate across all of her channels seems to be an average of one to two videos per day. So it's quite literally physically impossible that Anna Oop doesn't have any help with at least be able to prove to you guys without a shadow of a doubt that Anna Oop, one of the biggest T channels, one of the biggest drama content creators here on the platform is a part of a massive content farm. <laughs> And I, oh. Okay guys, that was the video. I hope you all enjoyed it. Um, thank you if you made it this far. Uh, I first like to give a big shout out to the editors. Once again, their names will be on the screen and in the pinned comment. They do a great job. If you want to check out more of their work, it'll be down there below to, to have a look at. I want to give big thanks to my patrons, um, $10 patrons on the screen right now. Thank you so much for your contribution, guys. And also my $50 patrons, um, Laura Woodward, Sari Tish, Esther Badoya, and Hypercube. Thank you so much. These guys have been around for a pretty decent amount of time now, so I really do appreciate it. What else do I need to thank? I feel like I'm missing something. Big thanks to uh, Thumbnail by Starfo. Big thanks to the artists who uh, do wonderful art, create in the video if uh, your art is featured in this video and uh, and you're looking for credit then just let me know merch um as i said we're still doing much i really like the mugs we do now if you want to check them out um once again link will be in the pinned comment and um it's getting a bit hot up here so i'll probably wrap it up quickly but hope you enjoyed the video and i'm the right opinion and i'll see you in the next one